12 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel on Think Tech. This is Think Tech Global. We have a special guest uh, for this show. Uh, this is Judge Shackley Raffetto, retired chief judge of the Second Circuit in Maui for many years. And he's also a director of Think Tech Hawaii. And he made a trip to Kiev. And I want to let him explain exactly why he went to Kiev and what he did there. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Good to be here. Um, I'm happy to sort of share with you some of the things I did on this trip. Um, I was uh, invited to come to uh, Kiev to attend a uh, conference on military justice. And it was uh, sponsored by the uh, <clears throat> couple of organizations, but the main one was uh, the uh, Partnership for Peace, which was established as part of, the NATO, a part of NATO after the Cold War ended to involve the Eastern European mm -hmm. former Warsaw Pact countries. Mm -hmm. And this particular conference was um, designed to uh, sort of prime the pump to begin to assist these countries in reforming their military justice programs uh, as a part of their overall military reform. And the piece there is that you are a re also a retired JAG Corps officer. Right. A captain. Right. Four stripes, that's very right. big. <laughs> yeah, and I also... <laughs> From the United States Navy. Yes, yeah, Navy Reserve, and I also served as a military judge for five years of that period. But, uh, but as a, um, that's how I actually got interested and started in uh, international things and teaching and traveling around and, and doing this sort of work. And, the organization that invited me actually is called the Geneva Center for the Democratic Control of Armed Forces. It is a Swiss intergovernmental organization that puts on programs like this all over the world. What does control mean in that context? It, it's basically talking about civilian control of the military as mm. their main function. A good thing. To, to try to assist uh, mainly the former uh, Eastern, you know, Soviet bloc countries to um, uh, develop uh, their democratic institutions uh, post-Cold War. Important. Absolutely. So you went. What was it like? Oh, Kiev is a fantastic, beautiful city. Uh, it's kind of on hills uh, next to the Dnieper River, which is a famous you know, river in Europe. A lot of uh, beautiful uh, cathedrals and beautiful buildings. I, I think it's one of the prettiest cities I've been to outside of, say, St. Petersburg. Um, and. Uh, you know, there's a war going on there. We were only about 100 miles away from where the war was. You went anyway. Place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you you didn't notice that, uh, and you know, if, unless you talked to people, and and then they they would talk about it. But you didn't see ambulances rushing through the streets or anything like that. But one of the things that I did have the opportunity to do was I I love to go to the uh, especially World War II sites that uh, that you can go to in Eastern Europe now that the Cold War is over with. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard about these when the Cold War was on, but we could never go to these places. So I, take that, I took the opportunity to go to one place on this trip, which is the famous uh, location called Baba Yar, which was a site of uh, some of the early mass, very large mass killings of the Jewish population of Kiev. And I went there to sort of bear witness and to, you know, I'm glad you went. pay my respects. And, yeah. and I'd like to talk a little bit about that today. And yes. I have some slides to show yes, you about that. Yes, why don't we that. go through the slides and see if we can find some on, um, on, uh, on the uh, Bobby R. Okay, uh, this is a military just Skip about four ahead. Right there. This is the Operation, Bar it begins here. Operation Barbarossa was the name of the German attack on the Soviet Union, which kicked off in 1941 in June. And as the slide says, it was the master plan uh, for Germany to uh, take over Russia. Uh, and in the next slide, you can see the, the, the organization of the attack. And you see the lower arrow. That was Ar Army Group South. It, they had Army Group North, Center, and South. And the Army Group South went to Kiev. And they got there in September of 1941. And, uh, and some of the things that happened when they uh, took control of the city. I, you want me to go into the details now? Okay, uh, let, let's go back to that one for a second. So when they got to Kiev, uh, they took control of the city. There was, you know, hundreds of thousands of people still living there, although the Soviets had uh, evacuated a large number. But the Soviet NK, NKVD, which is the KGB, the former name, they had placed a lot of big explosives around the city, and they started setting those off and killing German soldiers. And uh, they killed a number of officers in, a, in one of the big hotels, which was the army uh, headquarters. 
and uh, the, the, um, the military captured a person who was Jewish, who seemed to be, in, in their opinion, involved in this, and they used that as an excuse to round up and to basically execute the entire Jewish population of Kiev. And what they did was they, they, they put an announcement out ordering that all of the Jewish population report on a certain date and to bring their valuables and warm clothes. Uh, and they anticipated about 5,000 people would show up. 30-something oh, wow. thousand showed up. Oh. And in a period of two to three days, they took, th these people didn't know, they thought they were being resettled to some place in the, in the east because this was the beginning of the eastern occupation by the, by the German army. So they didn't know uh, what was going to happen in those times. And apparently when, in World War I, when the Germans occupied that city, they, they were pretty civil about the local population. So they didn't anticipate any, anything negative. This was before the, uh, uh, the big prison camps, the gas, gas chambers, camps, yeah. before they were invented, yeah. Right, yes. Uh, and so, and so they, they basically uh, fooled these people into thinking that they were going to be relocated, and they took them to this place called Babi Yar, Apparently in Turkic, Yar means gully or valley, and it is a big valley. I have, I have a picture, I tried to take a picture of it. And they, they- Is that it? They put, this is the, this is the older picture of how it looked uh, at, at about that time. And they used this, um, they just marched, they had everybody take their, their valuables off. Here they're mar this is a picture of, at the time of marching the people to Babi Yar, which is right on the outskirts of Kiev. It's actually in the city limits now, oh, but in order to find it, you have to, you have to, you have to seek it out. It's not, uh, it's not on the, it's not a regular tourist stop. No street sign there. No, no. Mm -hmm. And so I hired a car and told the driver what I, what I wanted, and and he he took me there. But the, but once the people were out there, they marched them out to the to this valley in groups of ten, and they killed them, and they killed. 30,000 people over a course of a couple of days. And uh, here's the mass grave. And here's the mass grave, yeah. Where'd you get these pictures? I got them off of the internet and a couple of the articles mm -hmm. that I, that I uh, sent on to you. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to go to this place to bear witness, just to you know, pay my respects and, and, uh, and, and get, gather information so I could share it like we're doing today. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think it's, it's important to really do that. remarkable what happened to there. Go, to go there and then I can explain it in a little more meaningful way. Now, one, one of the things that came out on a 60 Minutes um, program involving a, a priest, mm -hmm. uh, we discussed this, you and me, as a French priest who makes his, uh, who makes it his business to go to areas like this, mm -hmm. in fact, this very area, and uh, talk to people and find out, you know, because they, they, they're not easy. They, they don't talk about it easily. That's right. Um, and uh, to find out what happened, and he had discovered the last time there was a segment on 60 Minutes about this, we learned that, that, that outside the immediate perimeter of the Germans uh, shooting people in Babi Yar, there were the townspeople. Yes. The townspeople were there. Mm -hmm. uh, they came for, I guess, entertainment. Um, to see what was going on, because was going on. this is unique at that so, time. So, did you touch any of that on your on your trap on your travels? Well, I, di I didn't talk to any locals, but I I knew from what I'd read that 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 local population was complicit. There were groups of Ukrainians who assisted the Germans in the in the whole process, mm. uh, and of course, you know, they, they don't like to talk about this. In fact, they they didn't have the menorah. Um, Memorial erected until like 1967, and, uh, and for political reasons, they just didn't. You know, it was something that was pretty much hushed up, I guess, mm. uh, because they, they weren't too proud of what happened. Wait. And eventually, eventually, about 200,000 people were murdered. They they also murdered Soviet soldiers and political dissidents and a lot of gypsies, and the, and most of the rest of the Jewish population was wiped out. And then, at the, and then when the Soviet army was, was retaking that area in 1943, they, were, they had orders to, to cover this up and to disinter all the bodies. Can you, and there, there's interesting stories about what happens when you bury this many people in a particular place. What happens? Well, it, it gas forms and, and it, and it uh, comes to the surface and, you know, it and it smells and you know, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not something that's easy to cover up. Yeah. And so they were concerned that the Soviets, when they came through, they were going to find this and it wasn't going to be good for them. So they, they, what they did was they took uh, 
a uh, hundred or so people from a local uh, co concentration camp that was nearby. And it's a, it, I have the detail. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the details, which are pretty grim. Okay. They went to a nearby Jewish cemetery. They pulled out gravestones and they made foundations. And then they pulled the, the corpses, this is two years later, and they pulled the corpses out of the ground and they layered them with wood and, and petrol and, and flammable materials, in some cases two stories high in these funeral pyres, and they burned them, uh, all the bodies. And this took a week or so, or maybe a couple of weeks. And, uh, and then they, then when they got the ashes, their bones didn't all burn, and they took the gravestones and mashed up all the bones, and then they sifted through the ashes for gold and silver that might still be able to be found. And they had a name for these people, which I, I have here, but they, uh, they had a name that they, they gave them. But it is, a, it is a horrific, horrific story, but it actually happened. And, and if you show the picture of the, of the menorah, uh, slide. Yes, this is the memorial that they have there, and it was, I think, in 1967 that, that it first was put up. And uh, I don't know if it was exactly this one, but uh, anyway, it took a long time. Uh, there's another slide of uh, in the uh, of a yes. Um, it's not easy to find these places, as I said, and we we had to walk around, and they told us that the actual valley where the, this all occurred was not right at the memorial that you had to walk around. So we walked around and we found this memorial here uh, some um, yards away. And I have a feeling that this, is, this was um, a more personal memorial that someone put up on the spot. And I don't, I, I've got to get someone to translate the Russian to see what it says on there. But I thought that this had a really authentic look to it. Yeah. And then this is the valley, actually, which I think is the actual valley, the where, all, valley. Where, all, yeah, where all this occurred. And uh, so we, we, uh, we went there and wow. saw what we could. I'm That's glad the you story. went there and I'm glad you, you're talking about it now. It's, it's, it, was, it was one of the largest uh, mass executions by the Nazis in World War II. There were a couple of others that were same, sizable. And then, of course, the, the gas chambers but this was the hundreds beginning. of thousands. Yes, this yes. Was the beginning. And uh, the uh, the German army was actually complicit in this. They just they you know discovered later, uh, which was denied for a long time by the German army. But it was also these the SS and the Einsatzgruppen and these special details that they sent around on the Eastern Front to kill people and and they, you know they had their way in the Ukraine. They yeah. did whatever they wanted. Question: Did you did you see any in indication of, of Jewish synagogues or Jewish people? Did you meet any Jewish people? There is or a were Jewish. They all killed. I, I I I didn't, but there I know that there is a Jewish population there now, and you can visit it yeah. if you go there. Uh, and I highly recommend it. Kiev is a beautiful, interesting, very interesting city to visit. Uh, I, I have some pictures of the general, you know, buildings and cathedrals and we're stuff. We're going to see on. those right after the break. Okay. That's Judge Shackley Ruffetto, Chief Judge of the Second Circuit, retired, and also Captain in the U United States Navy JAG Corps. We'll be right back. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Fintech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We are here to talk about news, issues, and events local and around the world. Join me. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kawilucas.com, and also on Big Text. Okay, we're back. We're live with Judge Shackley Ruffetto, retired chief judge of the Second Circuit for many years, a director of Think Tech Hawaii, and a retired uh, JAG Corps captain in the United States Navy who went to Kiev. We're talking about his trip. We're very excited to hear about his trip. We're learning a lot from him. 
So we want to give us a, a little slideshow of uh, how it was. You took a lot of photos. Let's see some of them, okay? Uh, okay, these are just a general selection of photos. Th these are, this is a, one of the cathedrals right near the hotel where I say there are a number of these in Kiev. There are these beautiful uh, Orthodox uh, Christian cathedrals with the golden domes that, uh, you know, are so famous. And they, they maintain their, seem to, uh, seem to maintain their buildings really well. So that is, and there's a different one which is a very beautiful uh, cathedral as well. I mean, I think they're very impressive. Th these pastel colors like this seem to be characteristic of buildings in uh, Russia and in uh, Ukraine. Got a handle on how old they are? Must be 1,500 years. 1,600s, yeah, yeah. They've yeah. probably been rebuilt over time. Yeah. This was uh, just a street near the hotel where there were a lot of shops, but I, I thought that the architecture was really interesting, kind of old European... Yeah. look to it yeah. and this is uh, near the hotel uh, th in Eastern Europe you, you get a lot of uh, uh, statues like this uh, and I'll show you one as we get to it the Soviet statues are even more heroic mm. uh, now this is this is uh, near the uh, military museum which was closed but they had a lot of uh, things to see outside Th these soldiers here this is commemorating World War II obviously which they called the Great Patriotic War uh, and it was this huge uh, metal, um, must have been cast, I guess, a sculpture, uh, very heroic in the Soviet heroic style. You can see the, the big statue behind. That's about five or six stories high, and there's another right there. Yeah. This is typical of, uh, of heroic uh, statuary in uh, Eastern Europe, um, at least in the Soviet areas. Mm -hmm. Eastern Berlin has them. And, and then this is, this is a continuation of what you saw before with the soldiers, which is a depiction of, uh, of I guess, life in the Ukraine at, at, uh, during that period of time. And you can see the workmen and, and, the, and probably intended to... Shortly after the revolution. And here's the soldier, yeah. yeah. With the Tommy gun, really kind of typical of Soviet... Uh, uh, Heroic uh, statuary. Yeah. Now this was a this was a nearby area where they had lots of hardware, which I'm uh, I'm uh, really interested in. <laughs> These are old tanks. This is a museum area, so they, they had an incredible amount of stuff on display. So we wandered around. This is a famous MiG, I think Mi3 attack helicopter, which mm -hmm. was uh, so uh, uh, you know I guess effective from the Soviet point of view. And when the Soviets were in Afghanistan. They killed a lot of the villagers, and there was that famous uh, American senator, was it, who uh, provided the rockets yes, to shoot down the, yeah. to shoot, these were the helicopters that he wanted to shoot down. You can see they're heavily armed with a big cannon in the front, and they're armored, and they were, they were very uh, effective and, and deadly for, uh, for uh, against the, yeah. now here, this is me sitting in a MiG-21. Oh, oh, that's you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they, let, they let you sit in, the, in several of these jets. <laughs> And it was funny. There were these two uh, older ladies, in my age group, my age range, who were who were managing this place. And so you paid your paid a little fee, and then they walked around with you and uh, and showed you everything. And so as I got in this thing, I, I asked this lady. I said, "Is the ejection seat disarmed?" Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. And I was getting in, and I was. And she said, "Da da da." No, yes, yes. And I, and I thought. I wonder if she understands what ejection seat means. <laughs> so, so the place is really basically Russian, isn't it? I mean, they, they speak Russian, don't well, they? Well, they wouldn't like to hear you say that. No, I know that, I know that. But there's a lot of Russian influence. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, the Rus were from uh, Kiev. Yeah, that's yeah. where the Kievian knights are, were from. So can we talk about, um, you know, the, the whole thing about reforming military justice? Sure. And, uh, you know, the, and the fact that there's a really a lot of tension there now and mm -hmm. probably will continue with uh, Mr. Putin in charge. Yes. Um, so what was, what was the nature of the crowd that you met? Mm -hmm. What was the nature of the discussion? Um, and, you know, what did you learn there in terms of uh, the diplomatic relations of the area? Well, uh, I learned that a number of the, the countries are, are work together. Like there were representatives from Armenia and Georgia present at this conference, uh, mostly uh, people who've been working in military justice reform. Uh, after the Cold War, uh, these countries reformed their militaries because previously they had been part of the Warsaw Pact and really were part of the overall Soviet military. But after the Cold War, they, re they had to re sort of reconstruct their militaries and uh, 
during the Soviet period, they had a JAG Corps. They had uh, a separate military justice system, but when these countries were on their own, they didn't have that anymore. And so some of them just had no military justice system at all, which the military didn't like because they need a process to, for disciplinary purposes in the military. What do you do without a military justice system? Well, then it's the Probably civil. Brutal, the civil huh? No, that no. What happens is the civil courts handle it, oh. and and it takes the soldiers out of uh, the uh, availability for the military, and so that's basically a dead loss yeah. when the soldiers are taken out to be processed through the civilian system. And it yeah. takes forever, and yeah, yeah. and it doesn't. See, the perp the purpose of military justice is is to provide justice for service members and to, provide, to, to promote good order and discipline in the military. It's a twofold purpose. It's not just justice like it is in the civilian system. And so when you, when you don't have a, a military justice system of any kind, you've deprived the military of the ability to use that as a tool to promote good order and discipline. Mm -hmm. In our military, it's basically commander-centric. Uh, we, we provide the commanding officer with a great deal of discretion to decide, for instance, uh, who is charged uh, and sent to a court-martial, what the charges are, and what's done with the verdict of, say, the member's trial or the jury trial at the end of the process. Uh, in Europe, they, they, they are much more restrictive. But the, let me take a step back. The reason our, our system is commander-centric, and we can continue that, is our Supreme Court has said that they've recognized the military as a separate society which is based on discipline and there's the rights of service members, constitutional rights for instance, are more restricted than they are for an ordinary citizen like the search and seizure and things like that. It has to be in order to run a military justice system to run the military. Yeah. Yes, I think so and there's debate about that. Mm. Uh, uh, there are, there are uh, uh, people who think that we should pretty much di uh, make it uh, like, the, like a civilian system and, and take the commander out of the process. But my view is the commander is an important part of that process because uh, you know, the service members look to them for discipline and also for protection because the service member knows if they're processed in a military system that people who are processing them know what it's like to be in the military, know what the risks are, know that you can be sent any place in the world on short notice and, and maybe put, it, put uh, your life put at risk, yeah. uh, which a civilian court system would may not, not may not, it, yeah. yes, would not know about it, yeah. even though they think they might. <laughs> <laughs> but in, the, but in, the, in Eastern Europe, uh, most of those countries have signed on to the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, which created a court, a, uh, the European Court of Human Rights. And one of the provisions in that convention is that a person is entitled to a fair trial, and they don't make a distinction between the military and civilian uh, people who are, brought, who, are, who are brought before criminal justice. And so they, those decisions of that court ha have militated against allowing discretion in the commander like we have in our system. And so there's this kind of tension about how much how much authority they can leave uh, their commanders in, as they reform their systems. And but to my, some, that would be more liberal. To some, that would be more progressive. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and, and if you think about the recent 20th century history of Europe, you can see why uh, they want to, they uh, you know, perhaps restrict the discretionary authority of military commanders. So you come from the United States. You mm -hmm. come from the JAG Corps and the Navy. You come from the code of military justice and all the you know law that has been built up in the United States about that. It's not necessarily their system. No. So why do they want to hear from you? Do they want to the, go would, more to the U.S. system or do they want to go to their system? Well, they're, they're in that process. And I was, I was asked to come and provide a, uh, a lecture about the U.S. military justice system so that they could have a, have, learn a little bit about it mm -hmm. and, I, and I suppose think about uh, whether they whether they want to learn more and whether they want to try to adopt some of our uh, processes or not. See, we, even though we provide a lot of discretion in the military command, there's a lot of checks and balances on the exercise of that authority to protect service members. In fact, a, a court-martial is pretty much the same uh, as a criminal trial in federal district court. And, you know, if you if we were go to, wa to watch one, even though the it's terminology is different, yeah. but it's pretty much the same. 
you know, jury selection and so on. Although the, the members are appointed by the com commander, but. Well, it's interesting too that in, you know, in a place like the Ukraine and a lot of Europe, um, the civilians have been involved in wars mm -hmm. traditionally. They get involved, they get sucked in, they get killed. Whatever. Especially in modern warfare, yeah. Right, modern warfare, yeah. Um, that hasn't happened in the U.S. The U.S., the civilians, uh, they go into the military, but they, they are never, you know, involved at home mm -hmm. in, their, in their homes and their fields and their cities and all that. So we have, we have a different experience going here. Oh, yeah, and very few members of Congress have been in the military. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we have some pictures of the conference we can describe a little more. Or we, well, we show them. Or show, sh why don't you show the the other pictures of Kiev? Well, this is just the conference. It's me uh, okay. talking about. Military. Oh, this is a restaurant near, nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the food was fantastic, by the way, and very reasonably priced because Ukraine is in a crisis mode right now. You know, with the war going on there, so uh, the, it's a it's a bargain place to visit. <laughs> I, mean, put it, I thought this was great. Did you see the picture of Khrushchev? Oh yeah. <laughs> What do you call it? Sports, sport to catch? This, this is spotty, spotty catch. <laughs> oh, this was a military store I went to. Uh, you can buy anything in Ukraine. They had, uh, you can buy an armored vehicle at this place if you, <laughs> if you want. Yeah, yeah. Now, th these were two young men who were going into the military and they were buying some uniforms. And uh, I, they, were, they were kind enough to uh, translate for me. And we, we, had, a, we had a nice, nice uh, Kind of interaction with these young fellows. They were, were both, friendly. They were, yeah, they were both. Yeah, they were very friendly. There we go. And these these fellows were. This is a view from my hotel room. That's spectacular. Yeah. Would you go back? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was very, very interesting. A beautiful place. Great food. Nice people. This is a great yeah. thing you do, Shackley Rafetta. Oh, wonderful you. to you know to have you go as our emissary, have you engage with them and come back and tell us about it. We would like more of that. Oh, these are great people. I mean, I, I really enjoyed meeting all of them. You know, I've been to Armenia, and it was, it's a very interesting place. <laughs> Globetrotter. <laughs> Globe, Globetrotter judge, that's what we have. Yeah. Judge Shackley Rafetta, retired chief judge of the Second Circuit, um, director of Think Tech Hawaii, and a retired captain uh, in the JAG Corps of the United States Navy Reserve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay.